Hi, this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. This weekend, we are offering six conversations from Season 3, Episode 27, our wrap-up of the Fifth Global Nash Congress that took place in London on May 27th and 28th. This conversation includes the second half of the episode wrap-up with you and Louise and me. It starts with me posing a question about whether the winning position for in-office evaluation tests, FiberScan, Escopic, Sonic Insights, whoever else, will go to the best device or the most affordable in-office device, a conversation I haven't heard in meetings. Louise noted that no one discusses cost in a science meeting, but she also points out that her company, Tawas in Health, is designed specifically to reduce cost of out-of-hospital scanning significantly. This leads us to a discussion of the ways that the in-office devices might compete as the market evolved, cost being one of them. As we go on, I point up Becky Tov's discussion of liver volume. It's not as a point of interest to me. Yoram suggests the links between liver volume and quality of life through upper right quadrant liver pain, and Louise suggests that having patients in the meeting gave this issue new urgency. As our discussion discussion ends, each of us comment on what we would like to see covered in greater detail in meetings over the next year. The Fifth Global Nash Congress brought together industry, academic, and patient advocates in a forum that covered an array of issues and perspectives. We've tried to bring you an assortment of these in the episode 27 conversations. So sit back, listen, enjoy, learn, and when you're done, join the dialogue on our LinkedIn discussion group. Louis, let me ask another question that we don't debate necessarily, but probably should. It goes back to Jorn's comment. In, you didn't interview, but in your conversation with Rachel this morning, you were talking about Escopic and their presentation. I'm wondering whether the winning position in office elastography or ultrasound, whatever the technology turns out to be, is going to be the position that goes to the best device or the device that has the most accessible cost structure in a primary care environment. Because I go back to Jorn's comment, which is we've got to figure out how we're going to pay for all this. And if you claim that you're paying for it in terms of 10-year downstream investment, governments don't work that way. So you're going to need to squeeze costs at the same time you do that. I've not seen that discussion emerge much of anywhere yet. But so I'm wondering if there's anything in this meeting around Escopic or anything else that had to do with cost or availability of device as compared to simply the quality of the scan. Louise Campbell. Not that I saw. Nobody discusses cost. It's a science meeting. We like to discuss the theories, the trajectories trajectory is what we think. But the one reason I do what I do now is to try and break that cost structure. If you deal with volume as I do, it, we can bring it down cheaper. But I wasn't able to ascertain what the Escopics device was going to cost. It's two-dimensional shear wave with 50 hertz through. So their argument is it's a surrogate of Fibroscan. Now, Sonic Insights do one that's very similar. It's a surrogate of Fibroscan, but it's not directly related in its 50 hertz. It's a different mechanism and a slightly different way. The Escopics device is very interesting delivered by nurses. It can be delivered with minimal training. It's very visual. You actually even get to see the liver tissue, which is, I thought that was really entertaining. I was able to see my liver for the first time whilst I've had lots of fibre scans. There was an element of that. But again, we've discussed here before about surrogates of surrogates, how accurate are surrogates of surrogates, even if they're based on the same technology. Can I say it picked up my levels more or less the same as my fibre scan has done? Very similar. Yes, I can, because I'm certainly one person who's had both. Now, from and that, it was easy to use. It was done. But it will very much depend on cost because most people with poor liver health who can benefit from these devices are sitting in primary care. Most areas who have never been taught to use these devices and want to sit machines in cupboards and closets and staff them and do all of the requirements to set services don't want to invest that money. There has to be ways to get this out there, which is one of the reasons I developed what I do now and Towers and Health is designed to do that so that you can just... We just bolt onto anything. If you want 100 fibre scans next week, you get 100 fibre scans next week. If you want 10,000, you get 10,000. We're structured to do that without, and we bring the specialists to you to allow that to happen. But how that will happen, and I think that will be the issue for companies in new into the field. If you're going to sell it to healthcare, they still have the problems that EchoSense have with healthcare. It's kept very much as a niche product for only liver people, which means endocrine aren't familiar with it, cardiac aren't familiar with it. Once they get familiar, 
only with it. They really love it. But it's getting it into those areas. But did I like the device? Yes. Is it potential market taker in certain areas? I'd say potentially yes, because people won't necessarily go for the original. They'll go for a, a different version. Or the follow-up question on that is, is that the kind of thing that INCBCN should be talking about, is how to decrease cost, increase access to machines, to individuals, or is that a bit wide of where the mission is right now, do you think? Jörn Schattenberg. Oh, no, I think that's an important aspect. I think if you look at from a market regulation perspective, there are multiple tests and they're competing for access to the market. You have, a, you know, from an economics standpoint, a good situation where you have a certain competition that will have impacts on costs and propagate development. So I think that's good to have multiple players in the field. The important thing is, as uh, Louis said, I'm not sure we need a surrogate of a surrogate. We need a test that's linked to a meaningful clinical either event, which is down the road and difficult to get if you start a new company, or to something that matters to the patient, okay, or the physician. So you can either use it in a clinical trial to monitor drug response, or you can use it to stratify, risk stratify patients, or use it diagnostically. And I think in that context, you'll see money coming from drug develop. This is one way. If you want to implement it into the NAFLD referral pathways, yeah, you got to talk to different payers. I think then the discussion is more complex, but we're on a good way forward. Okay, one quick thought that I want to shift, and then we've got about 10 minutes to wrap up. My suspicion is that the reason they're talking about a surrogate of a surrogate is to try to, in some ways, take advantage of the voluminous fiber scan data that exists. Because you've got a new device and you say, oh, we're completely different, then you've got to build your data from scratch. That's long, arduous, and expensive. Whereas if you can say we're simply a better version of this, so use their data to, you know, I don't know that that's a viable scientific construct. Okay. So if some of the physics are very different, particularly if you use it as a threshold measure and quantify and qualify patients as disease is present or absent, I think that's one way you can develop it. It's more difficult if you're looking at gradual states and trying to understand how things change over time. Does that mean anything? I think this will be much more difficult for them. Okay. So I just have one more thing I wanted to share, which is I took from Rachel's interview with uh, Becky Taub that one of the things that she was talking about was them finding the importance of liver volume in some of their data. And maybe that wasn't something they expected to see to the degree that they did. Louise Nani, do I have that right from her presentation? Yeah, Jorn, I just would love for you to comment on that, the whole idea of liver volume and where it fits and what it might mean that it came out of the resmeterom data and how generalizable that might be. So one interesting aspect of the Maestro Nash study program is that the amount of information of physical data we're capturing, NITs, but also imaging data, is just much bigger than any other trials we've done before. And within that trial, we're, we're you know, if, if you'd like, and from your comment on Becky Taub being surprised, I would uh, rather understand it that way, that they're looking at the richness of the data they're capturing. And now post hoc, they have the opportunity to explore some of the parameters that as a clinician I know has an impact and they see it repetitively measured within their trial under standardized conditions and all of a sudden liver size changes. I know that a big liver is a referral reason for patients with NAFLD. I know that they complain of right upper quadrant pain, which is from an extended liver that gives you capsular spanning and that's the typical liver pain you can sometimes get. It's more of that mild discomfort. If you bring that down, down that liver size, that actually means a good thing for the patient in terms of quality of life. And I think you can see that in the readouts if you look at quality of life measures, which are done in parallel. So bottom line, the benefit for the patients and the field from these phase three trials, even independent of their primary endpoint readout, is the richness of the data that comes in and the ability to mine it and understand the pathophysiology and the drivers of the disease and what matters for the patient. Louise, thoughts or comments on that? I agree with Sean. And ultimately, this meeting started to span the gap, which was previously there with no patients in the room where you used to see a lot of mouse models. And how that was going to be interpreted into patient care was never a part of the process. And now to hear it back from the patient representatives again underlines the work that people are doing and how important it is to people, not just to look at the different basic science and the models. It's seeing the end result. That spurs people on. I think it generated some energy in the room. That was an advantage. There were some slight difficulties that we lost some speakers. They had to present virtually, which wasn't the initial plan. It seemed to be pulled together quite quite nicely. I would have liked to have seen the meeting virtual to get more people access to the information because the presentations were nicely done and some of the information was really enjoyable and thought-provoking. Okay, that's great. Any other thoughts before we just go to wrap up and onward? 
Um, no, I'd be interested to see what happens to it next year and how it develops and where it goes from here. Amen to that. Okay, closing comments. We've now been to Barcelona. We've been here. We're going to uh, Easel next month. What do you think is the most important territory for meetings to look to cover over the next year, somewhere at the intersection of what matters and what maybe hasn't been discussed enough? To be fair, I think Sean and Jeff brought it into their meeting. It's about this dialogue now between all of the areas and looking at NAFLD throughout the spectrum, not just NASH. Fat in the liver should not be there. It is an abnormality that is driving cardiovascular diabetes, liver outcomes. And I think there is now this dialogue that's happening about how do we pull that pathway together where we can identify everybody at risk, not wait until one risk supersedes another. That's what I've been most interested to hear more about and see more content of in these meetings. Gradually, NASH tag started it. There was the roundtable discussions. We had the EMA there this time for the, this meeting. We had the FDA, obviously, at NASH tag. We are developing in a rounded conversation. So I'd like to see Easel carry on with that. And having seen some of the programme, I think that is certainly on the agenda. Okay, you're- yeah, I think I agree with Louise. There's a number of flavors in the NASH conference fields. Some I like to attend as a clinician scientist. Some have really state-of-the-art translational scientists. I'm thinking back to Paris NASH, and we had Scott Friedman with us in the aftermath discussing some of the highly sophisticated technologies, single cell genomics we're doing here. There are others that discuss drug development and the pathway with the regulators, like the NASH tag, which I uh, enjoy. Then there are physician associations, EASL and ASLD, that have their standalone meetings, of course, and, and, and drive the field in terms of people bringing in their abstracts and, and, and high-end science. But I'm glad you mentioned the innovations in NAFLD here again, Luis, but I think it's exceptional for that, it, trying to practically address the, the problems we're facing in the field. And as such, I do think, albeit having a number of meetings, many of them have their standalone justification and audience that will attend them. I, I think you ought to land roughly where you did which isn't so far from Louise, but to me, the two most interesting things right now are what are happening at the extremes. Extreme number one being basic science and how much more can we learn about the basic science of this disease that will, I think, really drive us to think differently about cure over time or, or if not cure, certainly permanent stasis. And then on the other hand, taking the urgency of the patient advocates and converting that into what can we do now, which I think is what Barcelona really did a superb job of dialing up more than any other meeting we've been to before. And I, you're right, Louise, I see, you see more of that in the easel agenda. You see more of that in everything. I think the patients are coming more a part of the story, but nowhere as integral or central, I think, as they were yet, as, the, as they were in Barcelona. The, the large meetings serve a purpose because they bring everybody together and you can kind of figure out what's, I guess I'm going to call state of the art, no, well, leading edge maybe, but not, not leading edge, kind of, kind of up to date, okay? But the, the two areas that need the most work are the basic science and then delivering care to patients. And I think those are different meetings that are handling those. And now back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please send an email to questions at surfingnash.com. We'll be back next week to preview International Nash Day. Until then, stay safe, surf on, and we'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now.